Hey, what is up guys? It's your boy Speed here, and today we're going to look at Chris Lux Kunka. He popped off this game against Entity, going 8-1 and one and 12, topping the net worth chart. At minute 7, he is the highest net worth in the game, above an Alchemist who had a good lane, right? An Alchemist that has 45 CS at minute 7. Pretty crazy. And a kill. He is beating him by a long shot. 75 last hits and 2 kills by the 7 minute mark, getting into even the later stages of the game. Kunka still topping the charts, nearly catching up to an Alchemist. He popped off this game, and I want to show you exactly how he did it, so you guys can copy it for your games as well. Also, I want to tell you guys that if you've been struggling with solo queue, and you're looking to get to the next rank, I'm going to be able to help you. Like, literally, with the Game Leap website, I'm going to give you guys guides that are going to make it unbelievably clear on what you need to do. So if you've been stuck in the solo queue grind, you don't know what to do, and you want to become absolutely broken. <laughs> but like, actually, you want to become much, much better at Dota, and you want to take it more seriously, the Game Leap website is going to help you do that. So click the link down below, I'm going to help you get to the next rank, and I'll see you there. So Beast Coast as a team generally likes to pick Kunkka as a response to Puck. Even though you don't have good lockdown against Puck, or at least reliable lockdown, the laning stage is very good, and it's extremely easy to flash farm and out-tempo the Puck in the early game. Basically, you're a better ganker than Puck early on, you're a better farmer than Puck early on. You kind of just do everything better than Puck early on, and you beat him in lane. So do you counter Puck in the game? You don't, but you do kind of counter him for the first like 15 minutes. You're sort of just a better hero, you just do more than Puck for the most part. So as a result, in the laning stage, you're going to be spamming your Tidebringer, right? Puck has zero armor or like one armor at level one. So you're either going to hit the melee creeps if Puck walks up too far, or if any hero walks up too far. And if Puck doesn't, then you're going to go to the range creep and cleave him off the range creep. And so essentially you're going to try to Tidebringer as much as humanly possible. That's basically how this matchup plays out. And if you do that effectively, you can essentially just kind of destroy the Puck's HP with consistent Tidebringers. On top of that, one thing to note as well, because of how stupid water runes are, you actually want to use your Torrent very consistently. You'll see here he actually uses on the puck to sneak a couple autos. Really good discipline to still get the CS in between there. But basically, you want to use a couple of torrents. You should just use these torrents to either get a deny, right? You can threaten the puck when he's going to go for a CS or just to chip him down if he's going to go, right? For instance, right here, he thought the puck would walk forward to dodge a torrent. And so he looked for an opportunity just to hit the puck with a casual torrent so he would miss a few CS, right? And once again, because of how stupid bottle is in this current meta, you're gonna full heal your mana right off the bat. On top of that, he even went for a starting item build that uses the majority of his gold. And this is essentially what you always do against a hero like Pakis Kunka. You wanna try to really put the pressure on CS denies and you know hero damage early on. So the double gauntlet does that very effectively. Um, still going for the bottle, of course. Uh, some people actually don't, they go Double Bracer, but Double Bracer got nerfed pretty hard recently, and I've been a much bigger fan of this bottle build that he goes, and then back into Bracers. I really like the bottle because it does enable you to spam the Torrent way more in the lane, which actually does help you put pressure. On top of that, in terms of killing the small cam, basically once you hit level 3, you can do that. Essentially what you want to do is Torrent the range creep, Tidebringer through, and um, yeah, look to push in the wave. Torrent plus Tidebringer won't kill the range creep at level 3, so you do have to auto attack twice beforehand, or at least once. And then you can go and just take the small camp as soon as humanly possible. Two Tidebringers and a couple autos will kill most of the camps. And the reason why you want to do that specifically in minute 2 is so the camp respawns at, at minute 3, right? So you want to shove out the wave that spawns in minute 2, right? The wave that connects mid at 217. If you shove that out, then what you're going to be able to do is go for the small camp and just basically be as efficient as humanly possible. From there, he was actually doing very well against the Puck in lane. Puck doesn't really want to play the lane at this point, so he was actually staticking the wave very hard. Gets three denies on, on this wave, looks for a Tidebringer on the Puck, doesn't get it. But once you hit level 5, this is where things get really hard for Puck. Tidebringer gets to the point where you can pretty reliably hit them with it due to the range. A lot of people don't know that, but Tidebringer actually goes way further the more levels you get in it. Um, so it becomes much, much easier to hit the puck with Tidebringers. In this case, he's actually not going to do that. Instead, he's going to drag the wave to the small camp, going to use that for a Tidebringer opportunity. And this is just extremely efficient because if he's really good about it, he can look for another Tidebringer. Unfortunately, that one did not hit the small camp. But now, once you hit level 5, one Torrent plus Tidebringer does kill the range creep. And so you don't even have to pressure the puck. 
Can you? Yeah, but it's honestly unreliable. There's too much regen mid. You're way better off just crushing him in CS because of how much more efficient your hero is than Puck. And that's exactly what we see. And we're actually going to see a crazy solo kill. You heard that right? A solo kill on the Puck here. It's just so high skill what he does. He hits level six and he understands as long as he baits out the phase shift, phase shift is a very long cooldown at level one. Ever since they nerfed phase shift to eight seconds to level one, you can really kind of abuse that cooldown. A lot of people don't know that. It used to be 6.5 flat. That's no longer the case. And as a result, you can really punish it, right? There's a huge gap. And so in this matchup, right, he dodges it here with Puck or tries to dodge the Tidebringer and that sets up for the boat, right? The Puck was a little bit slow on the silence. I don't know if it would have mattered anyway, even if he did hit the silence earlier and he just gets a kill and that's the Kunkka matchup. He hits level six first. Even if Puck did hit level six, it frankly wouldn't matter. It's not like Puck six does anything to Kunkka. It really doesn't. And so once you hit level six on Kunkka, if you can bait out the phase shift in this matchup, you can look for a kill. At least you can look to do 80, 90% of Puck's health and force him back to base, which is once again, why this matchup is so rough for Puck. On top of that, he's even taking Puck's camps now, <laughs> taking his small camp away from Puck. And yeah, at level seven, Puck, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And this is the case for most heroes against Kunkka. Once Kunkka hits level seven, has that max out tiebringer, four second cooldown, he can actually look to pressure these heroes in the lane. We also will see him rotate, and Kunkka is just a great hero at rotating. Once you have phase boots and two points and X, it's very easy to get on top of people. They even saw his DB here, so they specifically knew this was happening. But it didn't matter, right? Easy kill onto the Wyvern. And you're gonna look to rotate quite a bit as Kunkka. Once again, it's one of those heroes where you wanna use your boat and then get back to your lane. Obviously, you didn't have to boat there, but you generally can. Another high skill strategy that we see with Kunkka is jungling. This sounds kind of stupid, but the thing is, let's say your support needs the mid wave. They don't do it here, but if your support needs the mid wave for level six or anything of the sort, you can give it to them. Your hero jungles unbelievably quickly, right? It really is one of the best mid junglers in the game, and you can take advantage of that and give your support an early six, which is very valuable. So moving on from there, he actually rushes BKB this game. I actually would have liked to see a really early Orchid come out from him because it does allow you to solo kill Puck, solo kill Razor, solo kill actually everyone on the enemy team this game. So I personally would have liked that build, but I will say that this BKB rush is way safer. On top of that, because you're a strength hero, it makes you hit really hard. He's actually hitting for 200 damage at this point in the game. And so basically BKB just lets you click people. Like whoever you X torrent, you can actually right click them. That's one of the biggest issues with Kunkka. Um, if you don't have a BKB, your hero can't kite out. Right, it can't disengage. It's not like an Ember Spirit or a Void Spirit or a Puck or a Storm or a lot of the classic mids. It can't get out. And so it kind of needs BKB to function so that I can follow up its X combo and auto attack the target down. Because X combo, of course, is not going to kill on its own. You need auto attacks to follow it up. But you can see he's actually not forcing anything this game until he looks for a kill bottom. And this upcoming engagement is kind of why this Kunkka BKB early is so destructive. Your hero sort of just wants to run in for its team, right? You just tank the attention, tank the spells. And it really enables everyone else around you just to do whatever they want. All right, they're going to go on him here. And keep in mind, he's four levels above the puck. Oh my gosh. Uh, but he's going to get gone on. And usually this would potentially be a death or definitely be a death for the Kunkka. But he gets healed from the Coddle and he's got the BKB to back himself up, which he did actually pop. It's bugged right now, so you don't see it. But it's popped and it allows him to secure a nice kill onto the Clockwork. So next up, Chris Luck is going to pick up uh, the Hyperstone. Let's quickly go over talents. At level 10, you're going to take 30 damage. At level 15, you take Torrid damage. At level 20, this depends on the game. If you're going an Ags build route, like Ags, Hex, Refresher, you take Torrid AoE. If you're scaling and you're snowballing really hard like he is this game, I would generally recommend the Tidebringer and Tidebringer cooldown. If you're utility, you go the talents on the right. You just have to determine if you're snowballing hard enough to go a right-click based build. Because right-click Kunkka requires a lot of farm to function. But either way, let's continue on. So why Hyperstone and why AC? It seems a little bit weird, right? Like why not a Silver Edge or something like that to play around the Tidebringer? Well, the thing is, I, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but your hero just straight up hits hard. You hit for 200 damage, guys, right? And if he gets something like Brigand's Blade as well, you're straight up a right-clicker. A lot of people have the wrong idea with Kunkka. They think, oh, I have to, you know, I got to play around one-shotting people. And it's just so outdated because the problem with that build is you're squishy, you don't have armor, like your hero literally has no armor with that build or like limited armor. He has broom handle and face boots right now, so he's got a bit of armor to be fair. But you have limited armor, you don't man up well, you don't have attack speed, and you're not taking advantage of the fact that your hero's a frontliner. 
You have Boat Rum and really high attack speed. And we'll sort of see just how strong his hero is in this fight. Even though Kunkka isn't like a 1v9 hero by any means in, in the early team fights, like it's not just gonna run around and kill everyone, it's just too clunky of a hero, Tidebringer is just a bit of a weird spell. He gets his BKB forced really early once again, but it's it's the same story, right? His BKB gets forced, but now he gets off a really nice ghost shift. Everyone on his team has 40% damage resistance or block or whatever you want to call it, right? If you don't know that, if you get clipped by ghost ship, you take 40% less damage. You take it eventually, like, so how the spell works is eventually you take the damage that you blocked, and that's why you, like, sort of take out, like, your Venal deed uh, as Kunkka. But, yeah, it just keeps his Nyx alive here, right? The Nyx barely stays alive as a result. They all overcommit. The Puck once again goes on a Kunkka, which is, like... I mean, Puck's trying to force his BKB, right? But he kind of wants that to some extent, right? He wants this Puck to go on him. Maybe not that early, right? That was sort of suboptimal because his BKB got like really, really forced and he wasn't really hitting anyone. But at the end of the day, that's why you go this build. And you'll see in this upcoming fight here why Assault Kuros is so good. Typically, a hero like Razor is actually a hard counter to Kunkka. And it is good against Kunkka even still to this day because it's very easy to keep the link on him and the Midas Armor is a big problem for a strength hero or you know, a hero that usually doesn't have very much armor. And you'll see in this fight though, that because he has like 30, what, 31 armor? Uh, depends on who he's around, if he has like mech and buckler or whatever, but he has so much armor that he gets full duration linked by Razor and just lives, just straight up lives, right? Also has 23 HP regen going here. So he's able to once again run in, really nice concoction from the Alk, puts him out of position and it looks like he's dead, right? It looks like he's definitely dead, but the BKB and the AC just straight up walks it off with a little bit of help from the Chen. And once again, the Razor has to overcommit on his high HP pool. So I know I'm kind of repeating myself at this point, but basically this build, it just works. It's way more reliable. It allows you to farm camps faster too, uh, because you you know, because you can kill camps even when Tybringer is on cooldown for four seconds. And so it kind of just works. On top of that, as we were talking about, he does take the 70% Tybringer cleave at level 20. Next up, he goes for Lincolns, which is, <laughs> it's a little bit weird, you know? Uh, you would definitely expect when you're snowballing this hard, a couple items, Satanic, Silver Edge, are, are both good and in your pubs. If you're not getting controlled and you're not hard countered by something like Razor, then something like the Silver Edge can be very good. You hit unbelievably hard on AC Silver Edge. You right click like a literal right click carry. It's very impressive. Um, he goes for Lincolns this game, clearly a response to the Wyvern. Um, to the to the Elk, to the Razor Link, you know, it's just a good Lincoln's game. It's really solid. And he clearly sees his identity this game as the frontliner. He's got a really high damage backline or follow-up set of heroes in the Night Stalker and the Offlane Coddle, right? Both these heroes do a ton as long as they can kind of just not have to YOLO in at the first person they see. And Kunkka can do exactly that. He's going to go on the backline and look at him chunk the puck. Like just straight up click in the puck. And this is what you do. When you go a build like this, you can just click and he's just chunking this guy, right? Talk about a hero that you usually don't counter. Kunkka doesn't typically do anything to puck, but he's so confident and can just run up because he's in no threat of dying with this item build and with the net worth advantage they obviously have. And he's able to just chunk down the puck, force him out of the fight, kill off the Wyvern in a couple of autos. And Tidebringer still, the Cleave still does a ton of damage as puck dies. I don't know what he was doing there. But right, that's gonna be all for today's video as we see him end off this game. It was just an absolutely beautiful performance from Beast Coast and Chris Luck in particular. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. And that's all, but remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below and I'm out. Peace.